take a look at the great city of Pittsburgh behind me. In the 18th century, this was pure wilderness. Matter of fact, Fort Pitt was a very important outpost, literally the gateway to the West. 150 years later, America was in the Industrial Revolution and Pittsburgh was in its golden age. For this unique episode, I will be recreating a menu for March 3rd of 1917 and share the 100th year anniversary of the Omni William Penn Hotel. Let's rediscover Pittsburgh as a taste of history. Isn't it a beautiful lobby? I have a spectacular cheese tray I'm nibbling on. But the amazing thing is, I found all these fantastic recipes in the archives of the hotel dating back 100 years that we're going to recreate. But let's find out more about this Grand Dame Hotel here in Pittsburgh. In March of 1916, the William Penn Hotel opened its doors in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and quickly became known as one of the most lavish hotels in the country. Industrialist Henry Clay Frick envisioned a sophisticated establishment that would rival the best hotels in Europe. This was the place to see and be seen. Henry Clay Frick, when he opened the doors, had a vision that guests would be treated better than anywhere else. The original hotel featured 1,000 guest rooms, as well as the opulent two-tiered grand ballroom, which occupied the entire 17th floor of the building. Guests of the hotel were pampered by a staff of 900 workers who catered to their every desire. Dining at the Art Deco-inspired terrace room was a culinary event orchestrated by the finest chefs. The William Penn Hotel has hosted every seated U.S. president since Theodore Roosevelt and countless celebrities. Following Charles Lindbergh's transatlantic flight, he was invited by the city of Pittsburgh to be honored, and the event was held here at the hotel in the Grand Ballroom. Here we have a very elegant dinner table setting, a period type setting of what we feel that a table would have looked like back in the 1900s. Obviously a very elegant look to the table, a lot of beautiful silver pieces. Dinner was an experience back then, right? So people took time to sit down and really enjoy dinner and to really make it a special event. This kind of represents the time when people really, you know, were trying to show off, if you will, a little right. bit. Right, <laughs> absolutely. Here in the speakeasy, a couple of really neat artifacts that I had mentioned to you were some old whiskey bottles. This one here is dated 1911. It's Old Bridgeport Straight Rye, and it has the William Penn Hotel name on it and the William Penn Hotel logo. Unique about your whiskey is that it was done and labeled way before the hotel was completed. Yeah, they actually started distilling before they broke ground for the hotel because they knew that prohibition was being discussed and they wanted to make sure they had a supply on hand to open the hotel. Walter, this is a room of uh, a number of archives that we've preserved near when the hotel opened. This is an old change giver that was used in some of the restaurant outlets. This is an old bubble machine having been made by the chief engineer of the hotel for the premiere of the movie up in the urban room. Made from a bread pan, the shoeshine lid box, and a fan. And it made bubbles, which uh, Lawrence Welk discovered later, and he used it to develop his champagne-themed music. From Hollywood, the one, the only, Lawrence Welk and his champagne music. So, Bob, obviously, this is my highlight of this room because here you got menus from 100 years ago and a good collection of it as well. And it's very interesting to see not much have changed, you know. The prices have changed. The prices have changed. <laughs> In the time of this hotel, everything was here. You had a flower shop and you had a chocolate shop and you had a sugar shop and you had a bakery and a butcher shop because in those days there was no convenience products available. That's right, we did. We had everything that anyone would need. So it was a, self it was a city in itself. A self-contained city in itself. The one that took me really for a loop was the fresh strawberry shortcake at 70 cents. 70 cents. When a fruit tartlet was 15 cents. There's so much to be learned from there, but not much has changed. It's great to have these old pieces to reflect back on part of the history of the hotel.
Jeff Bryan, so glad to be here at the Omni William Penn. It's fantastic Pittsburgh. to have you. And I cannot express enough, first of all, my thanks for you guys to open your kitchen, but to recreate dishes that were published here March 3rd of 1917, which was one year after the grand opening. It opened on March 9th in 1916, actually. You're celebrating your 100th year? year anniversary. Papillot, let's go ahead and do it. It's just a really classic dish. And it's really not that hard. You start off with a full-size piece of parchment paper. Basically, I fold that in half, take a very sharp knife, and I just sort of cut that into a nice heart shape. So then I'll open that back up, and I'll basically just work on the one side here. I'm doing a little bit of black forbidden rice with this. It's a little bit more of an upscale rice, but I like to put a little something down on the bottom. Now lay that out, put a little bit more of the starch inside of it, whether it's a fingerling potato or rice or anything like that. What I really like about this dish is, A, the simplicity of it, but two, it's just the way the, the flavors all complement and build on each other. Yeah, a little bit of fresh tarragon right in the middle. I just want to put just a little bit of salt and pepper onto this. Trout is a very delicate fish and you don't want to overpower it, you just want to accentuate the natural flavor. So when I get to this point, I basically just want to fold it over and let all that goodness kind of stay inside. A couple slices of lemon, just a little plot of butter on the top, a little bit around the edge of the paper. The most difficult about this is just actually making the folds. I usually start off like this, fold that bottom corner in, and then it's just a matter of folding it over on top of itself to create a seal. And then when I get to the end, I kind of give it a little twist and pop it back over. So, Chef, we're going to put that in the pan. Yep. We'll take this off to the oven. Put the starch in here with the, the rice, probably about 10, 11 minutes, 450. Fantastic. And we're done. The flavor stays all inside, so once you penetrate the parchment, it releases the flavor. We have our fish out of the oven, and as you can see, the parchment has puffed up quite a bit, and the way this would have been served 100 years ago is just like you're seeing on an ice platter. The server would have pulled back your parchment, and inside you'd be left with this delicious fish. Mmm. Let's get the flavors of the veg, yeah. the flavors of the rice. A little bit of lemon, the tarragon, just so spectacular. Make sure you yeah? save room. There's a lot of room <laughs> on your way, button. <laughs> Mike, yeah. so good to meet you. Pleasure to meet Mike you. is the sous chef here at the Omni William Penn, and we're doing a dish today that, again, it's kind of come back. It's a Chateau Brion. So, Mike, what's the first step, and what kind of meat would you want to look for there? Well, the first step with any of my meats, you always want to get them up to room temperature. And I start with a little bit of salt. So we have a little bit of pink Himalayan sea salt today. So the cut we're going to use today is actually a barrel cut. It's the mm -hmm. center cut mm -hmm. of the beef tenderloin. So we got it salted. It's rested for a couple minutes here. We're going to put a little bit of uh, cracked black pepper on it. When I put my pepper on, I, always, I like to use the butcher crack one. Mm -hmm. And I kind of go and I, I twist it through my fingers and kind of freshly crack a little bit of that on there. So our skillet's preheated here now. We're going to go in with a little bit of oil, just season it up here slightly. One other step I like to take with this is I like to build a little more flavor, just like roasting a meat. You know, if I were to put in some onions and peppers and celery, carrots, might as well put it in there now. So these carrots are going to take on a wonderful flavor and it's actually going to go into the beef as well here. And while we're at it, might as well go ahead and throw a little bit of rosemary in here too. All right, Chef, so now we're going to take this here and we're going to put it in the oven for about 12 to 15 minutes, cook it to about medium, and then we'll bring it out, rest it, and serve it up. All right, Chef, now we got our meat in the oven, so while that's cooking, we're going to go ahead and make our sauce. Fantastic. All right. A little bit of oil in the pan, and we're going to go in with our shallots here. We're going to start to caramelize these down. Just give them a little turn every couple of minutes here. A little bit of tarragon. We're going to go ahead and add a little cooking wine. As always, this one we want to be careful that our heat's not too high. So it won't catch the paint on fire right off the bat here. At this point we're going to start to build a little more flavor. We're going to go in with a little bit of that cracked black pepper. Mm -hmm. And just a touch of uh, sea salt. Like I said, I always like to stage it. We finish it in the end here, but we build it along the way. So our next step, we're going to put a little bit of lemon. Add some acidity to this dish here. Either use a slotted spoon or a strainer when we're putting our citrus in. This way we make sure that it catches any of the seeds and we're not leaving anything in there that shouldn't be. To make the flavors out of this skillet, this is already barely nothing in there. There's oh, they're, they're wonderful, the, the, the shallots and the... Uh, and it's and the, the simplest gun. ingredients too, yep. you know. All right, Chef, so I think we're just about yep. reduced enough mm -hmm. here. 
So now we're gonna add a little bit of veal demi-glaze into this, which is gonna make this sauce unbelievable. So the meat, what, what, 11 minutes? Yeah, just slightly yeah. over 10 minutes. We're getting ready to go here. We got all the herbaceousness from the rosemary work in the pan here, and we're gonna let it rest for about two to three minutes so that the juice is evenly distributed. Yeah, yeah. Bring it up and slice it down. Beautiful. All right. Pretending we are 100 years back, this would have been done on the table side. Exactly. I'll give it a little taste, see where we're at. Fantastic. Just needs a little bit of tweaking. Add a little bit more uh, black pepper. And more One more salt. pinch of salt. Finish up our tarragon. I have about a tablespoon and a half of some soft butter here. This is really going to cream the sauce out and just make it uh, really coat the palate. Wow. It just comes together nicely on your palate. All right. There we go, chef. Now we got lunch for us. A little bit of roasted uh, Yukon potatoes here to accompany our beef. The beef, when I saw it earlier, was just a really beautiful cut. Great Look at marbling. It. I, don't, I don't even need a knife. How do you like that? Isn't that something? You know what's, right. nice, what's nice about it? It's the simplicity and the flavors. Mm -hmm. They come together so nice. Can't go wrong with simplicity. Mm -hmm. Let's now go over the Fort Pitt that was built in the 1750s. I'm sure I'm not going to get a meal like that over there, though, so I might as well dig in a little bit more. What do you think? Might as well. <laughs> in the 18th century, Fort Pitt was a very important outpost, literally the gateway to the West. Fort Pitt was established at the onset of the French and Indian War. After years of French occupation, this land saw a shift in ownership at the assistance of a young British officer, George Washington. He was actually employed by the Ohio Company of Virginia to explain to the French that they were trespassing on what was believed to be then Virginia land. It was important for the British to establish a fort here in Pittsburgh at the forks of the Ohio to gain control over not only this land here, but land west of here, where the Ohio River flows into the Mississippi. George Washington is in charge of the 1st Virginia Regiment in 1758 when the British are finally successful in gaining control of this land. Fort Pitt is in the wilderness. This is the edge of the frontier in the early days of the French and Indian War, all the way up through the American Revolution. Soldiers are actually living outside the fort and then coming here to do their daily duties. And of course, with them brings various shopkeepers, other trades, and all that is growing up to support this fort here. We know other than their standard rations that they're getting shipped out here from Philadelphia, we know that they had a 10 acre garden located in the front of the fort. In that garden, they're growing root vegetables that they can store over winter and eat, as well as 40 other acres of crops to supplement the rations. Completed in 1761, Fort Pitt was not only a strategic fortification, but also an important post for trade between the English and the neighboring Native Americans. This trading post is important here to Fort Pitt because it is a place where the Indians would come in with goods. And this is essentially what they're bringing in, tanned deerskin. And it's actually to make leather breeches. Send off comers around here. This is the store, yeah. Soldiers could come and get their coffee, could get tea, could get chocolate, all those other things that they're not growing here. I almost feel like I'm here trying to buy something. I actually talked to this guy about three times already. <laughs> <laughs> During the Revolutionary War, Fort Pitt also served as the Western headquarters for the Continental Army. Colonists that are here continue to need protection, and to do that, they begin to encourage the Indians to remain neutral throughout the war. That leads to some of the first treaties with the United States government are happening here in Pittsburgh. What was once just a fort on the frontier soon witnessed the age of industrialization and a transformation into the vibrant steel city known today. March 3rd, 1970, the first item on the entree list is the agolette of beef. This dish in particular, I picked it because of the cut. So we're going to use a hanging tenderloin mm -hmm. today, which is personally one of my favorite cuts. I mean, you're thinking about the Chateau have a lot of flavor? No. Compared to that, that's a powerhouse of flavor. You just really get that nice yeah. beefy flavor. All right. Well, show Let's me what you it. got there. We're going to get a little bit of that sea salt on here. I think our pan's about warm here. 
So we're gonna go with a little bit of oil again. Bring this guy in here. And I'm just gonna do a little rough chop on a little root vegetables to build a little additional flavor for us. By the time we get this roast out of the oven here, we'll have a good chance to absorb some of that. Nice. Sprinkle a little bit of tarragon on top of here again. Mm -hmm. All right, chef, I think we got a little bit of caramelization starting to build on the bottom there. Go ahead and give us a little flip. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, look at that there. Beautiful. He's going to put it in the oven for about 11 to 12 minutes at about three and a quarter. He likes to keep it kind of slower because there's a lot of fat in this meat, so he wants to make sure that it's kind of really beautiful comes together. So oh, yeah. 11 minutes. Let's we'll smell those yep. parsnips Absolutely. and the aromatics coming and the yep, yep, yep. We're going to let this rest again for about mm -hmm. another two to three minutes here. All right, chef. So we got our sweet potato mash here, sauteed spinach, a little bit of garlic, and a little bit of white wine to deglaze. Look at that. Mm -hmm. Now you're going to cut this nice on the bias, I would assume, right? Exactly. Let's see how we did here. How about that? Oh, beautiful medium wear. Mm -hmm. We have some dinner to get to here. And I got one special treat for you here, Chef. You must know I'm from the Black Forest because we do that over there. <laughs> it's, uh, These are one of my favorites here. A little bit of pickled green beans. Let me see here. Mmm. And that's something? So simple and so good. Mm -hmm. High five on the two fantastic right, entrees. They're really spectacular, good flavor, good flavor profile. I like your method of cooking, incorporating herbs and root vegetables into it. So I'm going down to your kitchen. I'm going to meet Chef Brian, and I'm really going to find out how a Pittsburgh-style steak is made. Brian. Chef, welcome. I'm finally where I belong, <laughs> the main kitchen of the, the hotel. The heart of the hotel. <laughs> Perfect. What we wanted to demonstrate and kind of show you what we're doing here is the Pittsburgh style steak or the Pittsburgh rare. It started back in the steel industry and the workers in the steel mills would have a piece of beef and on the side of the steel kettles they would slap this piece of meat on there and the idea was that it would stick and when it was charred and cooked enough it, it would fall off and it would cook in just a couple of minutes. Very nice cut of meat simple salt and pepper and as hot as you can possibly get it. The flavor is really going to come from this caramelization and the charring on the outside. So there's a little bit of technique that you don't want to uh -huh. burn it. Right, you don't charring. want to burn it, you want to crust it. Because it cooks so fast on the outside it stays blue or very rare in the middle. Mm -hmm. yeah. I always call it this uh, sautéed steak tartare. <laughs> See how we're starting yep, to get that nice that charring hand. on there? So we're going to give this a nice little flip. Just the natural juices and the, the fat in the steak itself is what's keeping it lubricated. So let's pull those off. Amazing. But what you'll find is it sears in the flavors really well. And that's the reason, Chef, that you want to use a really good quality meat is because you're not cooking this all the way and you want to make sure that you don't have any bacterias and things. So the searing takes care of all that on the outside, but you want to make sure that you're using the freshest cut of beef that you can. It has a good flavor. I'm not so sure that me personally would order that anytime soon. <laughs> so now we're getting into the sweeter things of life. <laughs> Brian, let's... How are we uh, doing, Chef? <laughs> look at me, when I look at the menus, and I, I, as you know, this many dates back to March 3rd of 1917, and I saw all those great desserts. And Baba is actually one of my favorite, and I like your twist to it, that you want to put a blackberry and walnuts on it. So what I kind of did was I've already heated up my cast iron here a little bit, and all I'm going to do is just kind of put the milk into it, because I just want to get that milk a little bit above warm. Because if you don't have it, then the yeast will not activate. Exactly. Yeah, we don't, we don't want to kill our yeast right yeah. off the bat. We heat that milk up just, like I said, 115 degrees. We'll add it into our bowl. And at that point in time, we're going to add in our yeast. I'm just going to basically kind of stir it around and let it dissolve just a little bit, start to activate. After we've allowed our yeast to bloom for about five minutes, mm -hmm. you want to come back and you'll start adding in the rest of the ingredients. And at this point, we're going to make a soft dough. And once again, it's going to be kind of a wet dough, so we're looking for it to rise. And then the next thing I want to add in is my flour. And then, of course, Chef, you know, the most important ingredient in any dessert is going to be whole unsalted butter. No butter, no flavor. <laughs> exactly. And then basically what you want to do is kind of fold that in there. And leaving that butter in room temperature is kind of, kind of help the flakiness of the pastry. 
So once we get to this point, we're going to take a damp towel that I've got sitting here, yeah, yeah. and we're going to allow it to rise for about an hour until it about doubles in size. We've almost doubled in size here. And now so the second step is you just want to add in your rum-soaked raisins. It's a lot of nostalgia for me because when I worked in Switzerland, it happens to be that every single time I ended up in the bake shop, there was baba rum was the daily dessert. So I made my share of babas, and I know how important the rum is. All right, so chef, the next step after that, you want to lightly butter the your uh, mold. Usually I just kind of make sure I generously get everything and try to get every crevice in there. The butter adds a little bit of crispiness to the outside. And, and, and the skin. Mm -hmm. Yes. We add in our walnuts. We'll start adding in our dough. And the next thing I'll do after that is I like to press in the fresh blackberries right into the dough. I bet it enhances the flavor big time once it bakes. It does, once it really it does. Bakes. And it kind of the, the juices from the blackberry mm. kind of leach around that general area so that you get a contrast of flavors. So we'll add the lids. We're going to let these rise for about another hour in a warm spot and then off to a 375 it. degree oven. Fantastic. All righty, chef. Be careful. These just came out of the oven. Oh, yeah. Huh? Yeah, come out nice, don't they? Beautiful. The next step on this is the rum sauce. It's kind of come through and poke some holes in it so it absorbs a little easier. And you don't want to go all the way through because you don't want to mess up the outer look. You'd be amazed at how much sauce that these things will actually oh, I do absorb. Know. Sucks it right in. You want to give it a couple minutes to absorb, and then you're ready to plate. Ah, uh, God, our baba. Fantastic. So the way I like to finish this off is basically I just put a little bit more of the rum sauce on the outside. This is a locally made apricot preserves. More flavor. It's just a little, little bit more flavor. It's going to yeah. really be dynamite. And then I come through with a little hand whipped cream, a couple little blackberries on top. There you go. Beautiful. A little sprig of mint on mine. I just hope it measures up to the ones you did in Switzerland. Better. Ah, thank you, Chef. And I think the soaking was just perfect. Take a look. Yeah, definitely it, came through perfectly. It's nice moist, but mm -hmm. it's not too moist. Yeah, it's not falling apart. And it's the trick on the baba. What a way to look back at 100 years. I'm looking at the menu and I see fresh strawberry shortcake. The surprise was March 3rd, 1917. Exactly. And there's no way that you would have fresh strawberries up here in March the 3rd. This is impossible. Well, Chef, that's where Pittsburgh is really unique. We have a huge rail hub, which is now what we call the Strip District, where tons of produce Came and meats so, yeah. and just cheeses, anything that you could imagine, were brought by rail car. The strawberry shortcake is the most expensive thing on the menu. So I'm sure it had to be elevated in some manner. Also, I thought maybe since they had a big dinner here for Charles Lindbergh, maybe he flew him up from Florida. <laughs> he brought him with him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so chef, my interpretation of this, because of the huge Italian influence that they have in Pittsburgh, was to take the strawberry shortcake and change it up using an, an Italian pizzella. So this dish is really pretty simple. I'm going to start off with a uh, copper pot, mm -hmm. nice and hot, because one of the ideas behind this is we want to kind of caramelize that butter just a little bit. That's when we should start adding some flavor. Some sugar. Too many chefs are so flayed. Take the butter, just melt it. The flavor comes when you slightly brown it. Exactly. Okay, we're going to add in our strawberries. They just came off the drain from Florida. So a little bit of vanilla. Yep. A little lemon zest, not much. And the final step on this is we're going to add a little bit of Grand Meunier. This is where you're going to get that nice flame. And that would have been the dining room in the show, sure. the dimly lit room, the flames are going. The way I wanted to do this, Chef, was I wanted to start a little bit of a contrast between the softened strawberries and the fresh strawberries. So I've got a little bit of a texture change there. A whipped cream and add my pizzelles. And I'm going to kind of layer this just a little bit. We'll come in here with our sauteed strawberries. All right, so, Chef, what I really want to do is... Get some you know, of the liquid on it, got Exactly. You. I definitely want to get some of this beautiful liqueur we just made to drizzle over top of this plate. It just, it says, eat me, please. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. well, you enjoy. What a beautiful dessert. I can see now why it's the most expensive item on the menu. <laughs> it was a very interesting look back, a hundred years of culinary history. Chef Brian, Chef Mike, you guys are absolutely top-notch. Thank you, Chef. It's been an absolute pleasure having you visit us here at the Omni William Penn Hotel in Pittsburgh. I thank you guys. Fantastic job for a taste of history.